Welcome to the USU Career Studio podcast that helps you navigate your career path. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to tell your friends and family all about it. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to get access to our newest content. Thanks for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armistead, your host, and I am so excited to have Dr. John Armstrong joining the show today. Welcome, John. Thank you, Marissa. Good to be with you. Dr. John Armstrong is Southern Virginia University's Willis J. Smith Professor of Philosophy, an honor that acknowledges a senior professor for outstanding scholarship, teaching, and citizenship. Dr. Armstrong founded SVU's philosophy program in 2002 and has been with the university since 1998. He has served as an associate provost, coordinator of institutional accreditation, and chair of the humanities faculty. Dr. Armstrong has published in top journals on Plato, Aristotle, and Epicureanism, teaches courses on ethics, political philosophy, early Chinese philosophy, and ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. He is currently working on new English translations of Aristotle's ethical works and some of Plato's dialogues for college students and the general public. So, John, before we dive into your deep philosophical thoughts on life, (laughs) I would love to start by hearing more about your um, high school experience. You have a really interesting story to share about actually being in Hong Kong during that time. So maybe take us back to high school. Sure. Thank you for that introduction, by the way. I went to elementary school in Salt Lake County and to junior high school in Davis County, but I would have gone to Davis High School, but my parents were called to preside over the missionaries in Hong Kong for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so I spent my high school years at a British school in Hong Kong. Hong Kong uh, back then was a British colony until it reverted to mainland China in the, in the late 90s. That school is called King George V School, named after one of the uh, British kings in the early 20th century. My peers were from many countries, including India, Pakistan, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Many were English or Scottish, and some were Americans. Many had Chinese ancestry. Everybody in the school was a native English speaker. And as I look back on my peers, I'm impressed by what an international student body it was. But at the time, I was just kind of a scared new student, wondering if I looked weird in this uniform they were asking me to wear, but (laughs) nobody else was self-conscious about wearing a uniform. And so, yeah, I mean, they had an assembly at the beginning of the day on some occasions where the principal would read a prayer from a book and we would sing like a hymn together. And this wasn't a religious school. It was just like, this is what the British schools did. And anyway, I uh, didn't notice this ethnic diversity so much back then. Um, I was just, you know, trying to make new friends, do my homework and play sports and typical high uh, school. KG5. Yeah. The school is called KG5. That's the, the short versions, King George V. They didn't have American football, so I played uh, rugby instead. Wow, very cool. Well, I'm, I'm curious because you kind of mentioned this aspect of diversity in the classroom and, and elsewhere. I'm curious, what is something you learned from that experience that has stuck with you throughout the years? Well, I, I guess I learned that early on that uh, kind of people are people the world over and that they have kind of normal concerns and normal lives. And, and so I, I guess I learned that, I don't know if I would have appreciated that as much if I had spent, you know, all my educational years in the United States. And so I, I guess I just came to appreciate that the peoples of the world are all human and all have typical concerns. You know, we were all teenagers just concerned about teenager things. Um, yeah. That's what I, that's one of the main lessons I think I learned from that. I love that. I love people are people. I think that's so true. And especially, you know, it's interesting with a lot of the political and social um, movements that we're seeing. I think sometimes in the midst of all of that, we forget that that common principle that we're all people. We're all imperfect people, you know, with a lot of the same concerns and a lot of the same values. And so I, I really like that perspective as we begin today's conversation where we're, we're diving into this concept of developing lifelong learning habits throughout the course of our careers. And so 
kind of continuing on your timeline or career timeline, if you will. Um, so eventually you graduate high school and you decide um, to earn a bachelor's degree, but you also serve a religious mission. So talk to us a little bit about the timeline of earning your college degree and how the mission fit into that. After King George V, I took kind of a graduation trip through China for a couple of weeks uh, with my brother and another man. That was kind of a fun thing. We, it was actually my second or third time into mainland China at that point. We're talking in the mid 80s at this point. And I went to BYU for a couple of semesters, took general education classes and uh, Mandarin Chinese. When I was in Hong Kong, I learned a little bit of Cantonese. But I, I took a Mandarin courses as a freshman in college. And then I spent a semester in Jerusalem. And then I went on a mission to Taiwan. So I served for two years in Taipei and uh, taught the gospel in uh, Mandarin Chinese. And then I came back and resumed my studies. Before my mission, I was thinking I would study international relations and maybe become a lawyer, kind of. Maybe my father was an attorney and maybe was thinking my experience in Hong Kong made me a little more international than other people. But after my mission, I started to think about studying medicine and majoring in microbiology. And I sort of started down a pre-med track. But some of my friends were interested in philosophy and I liked the philosophical questions that they were talking about. And I also took a class in uh, ancient uh, Greek and Roman literature and was really impressed by the kind of the courage and the strength that I saw in the ancient liter literature. And so I decided to start learning ancient Greek after, this is during my sophomore year, I guess, and I've, I've not stopped. So every semester I'm, I'm reading something in ancient Greek and this has been going on now for, you know, more than 30 years. <laughs> so that's been one of the, I think, smart things I did as an undergrad was, was Start that. And I was also studying, continuing to study Chinese as well. So eventually, how did that turn into you saying, actually, I want to make this a career? Yeah, good question. I always thought, if, you know, I could study almost anything and still go on to law school or medical school, which was sure. true. But at uh, as I approached my senior year, I kind of thought, you know, I, I just want to see if I can stay with philosophy and keep going at it because I like it. And I think that it's important that people think about philosophical questions in a careful way in a safe environment where they're not teased or something about their opinions. And so I, I thought I'd, I would just go for it. And so I applied to different programs in the United States and ended up going to the University of Arizona where I pursued a PhD and, and did it in uh, six years. And I also spent one year at the University of Texas at Austin in their classical philosophy program. So I have to pause for a second and ask, you know, at what point did you bring this up to your loved ones, whether that was parents or your wife? I mean, when did you say, okay, so I'm going to pursue philosophy and what were their reactions to that? <laughs> I'm glad you brought up loved ones. I actually met the woman I would marry during my first year of college and we corresponded during missions. She went to Switzerland and France and I was in Taiwan and we corresponded for more than two years while we were separated and we married when about eight months after she returned. I came home first and then she came home and then we married at the end of that year. She was supportive. She came from a family of academics. My parents, I think, had some misgivings about philosophy, kind of wondering, what do you do with that? You know, especially as a graduate degree. You know, I think they eventually, that were not even eventually, they quickly supported me and, and uh, they even attended some of my scholarly presentations when I presented at conferences. And I think they have been proud of my work here at Southern Virginia University and uh, what I've been able to help the university accomplish in you know, these last 22 years. Absolutely. Well, and I'm glad that you had some support. I think it can be a really difficult dynamic for students, especially when um, maybe they, you know, in their heart, they're kind of leaning towards one subject and their parents are heavily pushing saying, you know, you know, you need to be a doctor, you need to be a lawyer. And so I think um, there can be some pretty heavy pressure there. But I love that um, you just, you know, you identified what you were interested in, what you wanted to spend your time doing. And I think that's so important as we look at our careers. Well, you know, our families are obviously a huge factor in that. At the end of the day, we're the ones who are spending, you know, eight plus hours a day doing it. And so if we hate it, that's a rough life to live. 
<laughs> so I love yeah. this, you know, idea of finding something that you're interested in pursuing it. Yeah. I mean, I often hear people say, you know, find your passion and pursue it. And it's wonderful if you can have a career that connects up with the passion like that. Um, not, it's not always the case that it will, though. I and mean, sometimes work is just kind of hard, but it can still be meaningful, even if you're not able to, you know, find something that you're uh, completely passionate about. I wouldn't want to say that if people end up working for a company whose product they don't entirely believe in, that they're doing something, you know, that's not worthwhile. Because in a way, when we participate in our larger society and help an economy work and provide for our families, I think all of that is uh, meaningful. Absolutely. And I think that also is a good point that um, in different stages of our lives, we have different opportunities. And I think sometimes we're able to maybe be very passionate at, at one given point. And at other times, it, it's simply about paying the bills. And I think all of that is important and good. So I appreciate you you mentioning that. I, passion, I have a love-hate relationship with that concept when it comes to careers. So, <laughs> so I can definitely yeah. relate to what you're saying. <laughs> So I'm really interested in learning about some of the critical skills that you learned from your formal education that have helped you become successful in your, your career today. Good. Well, one of the things that philosophy really emphasizes is uh, logic and learning to put together a good argument and assess arguments on their merits. So and by logic, I don't mean, you know, just sort of what anybody in particular thinks is reasonable. There is a formal discipline called logic, and you can take introduction to logic courses in college and, and more advanced courses. So philosophers are usually the ones that teach those classes. And, you know, just a simple lesson from course in logic is how to understand an if-then statement. You know, we use the word if a lot in ordinary language, but when you use the word if for logic, you're signaling what's called a sufficient condition for something else. So if you say something like, if you give me chocolate, then I'll give you a sandwich. Well, giving the chocolate is a sufficient condition for getting the sandwich. Okay. And then what goes in the second part, the then part of a conditional statement is called a necessary condition. So if you say, if you give me five bucks, I will give you a sandwich. Being given a sandwich is then a necessary condition on giving, being given the $5. More often we indicate necessary conditions with the phrase though, only if. So if you say, I'll buy your house only if you fix the roof you've just laid down a necessary condition for buying the house or i'll buy your house only if you fix the roof and you repaint the living room so you just put down a second necessary condition so sensitivity to necessary and sufficient conditions is something that philosophers get trained in and it's a good skill to have because it's an ordinary kind of expression we use in English, you know, if then statements and only if statements. And it, it allows one to read critically any sort of argumentative text where somebody's trying to lay down conditions or make an argument. So that's, that's one skill. I love that. And I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a second here and ask a question that I didn't prepare you for, which is, can you give an example of when that might be helpful outside of the, the philosophy realm? So maybe this is like with a child or maybe with a spouse. Can you give me an, like a real, like an everyday example? Well, with your, in family relations, you usually don't want to, you know, be, <laughs> uh, testing people with about the logic of their ordinary expressions in the home. But when it comes to legal documents or when it comes to policy debates, you know, whether somebody is indicating a sufficient or a necessary condition is a big, makes a lot of difference. And so learning to read people's arguments critically and understand exactly the logical implications of what they're saying I think is very important. So I, I don't, I wouldn't so, so much say that it has a lot of application to ordinary life with your family, but it does have a lot of application to legal and policy issues. Noted. Good, good thing for me to know. But I, I love that legal application. That's perfect. So on a slightly different vein, I want to ask a little bit more of a personal question, which is how have your philosophical studies influenced your character or who you desire to become? I think, you know, philosophy might be something of a secondary influence on 
who I want to be. I think those types of ideals come primarily from religious sources and uh, from parents. But I guess I would say that philosophy has made me appreciate certain things that I wouldn't have appreciated in life, such as how hard it is to understand really difficult philosophical issues like the nature of free will or the nature of consciousness. So I think that generates a kind of intellectual humility and awe, which I think is a good thing to have. The study of philosophy has also brought me into contact with a lot of people I admire, my undergraduate professors, my graduate professors, my colleagues, here at, at the college are all people I admire. But I guess one of the things that I would have to say on this issue of does it make me want to become a better person is I, I do get to talk about and study some really major figures in the history of human civilization, and in particular, Socrates and Confucius. So for Socrates, you've got to admire his intellectual humility. He doesn't claim to know things he doesn't know. Right? He'll, he'll just say, these other people, they claim to run the whole society, but I don't even know what justice is. Wouldn't that be an important thing to know before you try to take over society? So I admire that in him. I also admire in Confucius his emphasis on traditional ritual and practices and the need to transmit those to have sort of a common sense of order in a society and whether it's at the family level or at the more general level of politics. Those figures, as well as I get to bring up the teachings of Jesus too in my courses and all those figures are committed to living a, a righteous life. So when you're talking about that with students that obviously tries to, I'm sure it has some influence on me and what I aspire to want to be like. Absolutely. I love that. And as I'm kind of transitioning to my next question, uh, and as we're considering this idea of lifelong learning, I think oftentimes learning can be really challenging and sometimes we have to adapt the way that we um, are taking in information or trying to understand the information. So I want to pose this next question, which is um, having you describe a professional skill or maybe a college course that the content did not come naturally to you and how you adjust either your learning style or maybe the habits um, to learn that skill or content? Well, I have been thrown into courses where I didn't have enough background to get an A. I usually have pretty high expectations of myself academically, but I have, you know, in high school, I was thrown into a chemistry course where the students had had a lot more chemistry background than I had. And then in college, I took a calculus course when I hadn't had math for over three years. And I just found myself not understanding very much of what the professor was saying, you know. And so what I did in that case is I hired a tutor. I, I paid out of pocket for a math major to tutor me. And I worked really hard just thinking, I just hope I pass this class, you know, because I was kind of dying. And... <laughs> I was glad I took the final. I wasn't sure how well I did. I ended up getting a B plus. I'm not sure I deserved a B plus, <laughs> but I was glad to get out of there with that grade. But I also appreciated, I, I, I did get to glimpse the power of calculus and how, what an amazing intellectual discovery that was. So I, I did appreciate that. I love that. And I hope you don't take my comment the wrong way, but our paths actually crossed because I was your student at one point at SVU. And it's funny because that was my very first semester of college. And I believe it was my first semester that I took your course, um, which I think was like an introduction to philosophy, if I remember correctly. And I have to say your course was so difficult, John, but it wasn't, but, but what was interesting is it was difficult because I couldn't apply a lot of the skills that I had learned in high school. You know, oftentimes you quickly memorize something, you take the test, you move on and you never have to remember the content. But I remember, you know, as I was doing the readings of these incredibly intelligent people, you know, of history, I just started to realize I needed to apply those principles in my life. Like I needed to be 
more intentional and I needed to analyze things deeper. And, you know, anyway, so I, I really appreciated your course for that reason. And so I guess for me, that that was a bit of a challenge at first because it was it was a tough and challenging course. You pushed us to think. And, and again, we couldn't just apply those basic skills that I think a lot of us rely on in high school. But I loved the challenge and I, I loved being able to learn something that was just so different than the ways that I had been taught before. So I'm grateful that I'm not the only one who's felt that way. And, and I'm grateful for your course, by the way. <laughs> but I love this well, idea good. of I, learning. <laughs> I hope you appreciated it. You know, I, I just, I tell students, this isn't just about getting a grade anymore. This is about thinking about your life and thinking about important questions that, you know, a thoughtful person should think about. Absolutely. <laughs> My next question that I have is about kind of your professionalism. Um, so I'm curious, in what ways have you pushed yourself to grow as a professional once you've had the job? I think it's really common that, you know, students who are in college, they're pursuing, you know, this academic career and they finalize, you know, in their head this this job or this occupation is the end goal. But once we actually pop into an occupation or a career path, that's when the real learning, at least in my perspective, that's when a lot of the real learning starts when there's so much to be learned. And so I'd love to hear again from you, what are some ways that you continue to push yourself and not get too comfy in, in your field? Yeah, well, when you go, when you become a college professor, you've had so many professors in the past, you can just kind of model what you're doing on what you've seen done. But you also need to continue to develop and critique your own performance. So discussions about pedagogy or have been an important part of my career for over 20 years with my colleagues, reading, learning to new technologies, different ways of thinking about what I'm trying to accomplish in the classroom. And that that's just not stopped. You know, I, you know, I, I continue to try new things and because I want students to be engaged and reflect and be thoughtful for the entire time we're together. And pulling that off is often not easy. So there's always that as, as a teaching challenge. And then, you know, this new technology environment that we're in with uh, Zoom and online tools, I've continued to, uh, you know, learn about that and teach my colleagues on about how to use that kind of thing. In addition to that, which I think is pretty common to college professors across the country right now, one of the things I did, I started to do back when I was a graduate student is I learned some HTML. And so I've been able to like make and adjust websites, you know, for, for more than a couple of decades now. And so that, I think that's been sort of a leg up for me. Since I became a professor, I've had to learn, see, I basically just used Microsoft Word when I was in graduate school. But I've since learned Excel and PowerPoint, and I've learned Apple's tools like Pages and Keynote. I've learned how to use Camtasia and do some basic video editing, learned how to alter images, basic photo editing. So these are other skills I've just kind of picked up so that I can present my material to the students on our learning platform, which is called Canvas in an attractive way. So that's one thing I've had to do as a professional. Something else that you might not have expected is, you know, when you become a professor and you kind of learn about how colleges operate more, you realize that we're part of a regulatory environment that is just kind of not really appreciated. And so I've had to work to learn the rules of accreditation and uh, authorization to grant degrees and have helped the institution comply with lots of regulations and write reports and that kind of stuff and learn new language about learning assessment. And much of that has been rather unpleasant and not worth doing for its own sake, I would say, you know, but just sort of necessary to do to make the place a success. Absolutely. And I, I love that you're bringing up kind of, I don't want to call them harsh realities, but um, sometimes even if we're in a career that we love, you know, generally speaking, you know, you love the content that you teach, you love that you get to interact with students. Um, but sometimes there are parts of our job, maybe even the dream job that we don't love. And that doesn't mean we necessarily have to change careers or, you know, switch paths because of a few parts that maybe aren't 
our favorite part of the day, but they're simply just part of the process and part of learning. And so I love that you're, you're bringing up some of those realities just because I think um, sometimes we get into this, you know, it has to be perfect. I have to love every second of my job. And I think sometimes we just have to do tasks that maybe aren't our favorite. So I love that you brought up that reality piece. <laughs> Yeah, there are lots of, you know, unpleasant realities, I'm sure, at all kinds of jobs. So Something I'm also curious about as you were talking about um, your teaching, I'm curious, what are some skills that you have seen successful students really develop throughout this past year of COVID-19? There's been lots of challenges for faculty, but also for students to switch maybe to the online platform that not everybody is a huge fan of. And so I'm curious, you know, what have you seen successful students do that have allowed them to continue to find success regardless of those challenges? Oh, that's a great question. Well, when back in March of last year, it was, we could tell that there was going to be a need to go online. You know, really, my heart was kind of breaking because what it meant, and, you know, I think one, I kind of got a little bit emotional in class one day. I said, you know, I'm, I sense that this could be our last time we meet together. When you're in small classes, you get to know each other, you enjoy conversations together about important subjects, and then suddenly you're distanced from each other and having to talk over computers with each other. You know, addressing students, your professors are human beings who want to connect with you, you know, and so if you don't sort of you, you kind of have to take the extra step to connect. If you don't turn on your video feed, if you don't ever speak, if you don't reply to emails, then you are cutting yourself off from a person who could help you out, not just in this course, but maybe later on in life. So my advice would be to reach out to your professors, connect, be communicative. They can't see your body language anymore, you know, so they don't know how you're reacting. Don't let yourself be distracted in class by your phone or by eating or whatever. You know, focus, try to get the most you can out of your course and connect to that human being who's trying to teach you something. Because they see themselves as trying to give you something important, like a gift. And so you should respond in a way where you let them know you appreciate what they're trying to do for you. I love that. And, you know, I know every student's circumstances are a little bit different and, you know, some may or may not have the same capacities, but I, I totally agree with this idea that we still need to stay engaged as best as we can and that those networking opportunities are still there. They look different than they have in the past, but there's still those opportunities, like you said, you know, whether it's via email or Zoom or however, you know, you offer it as a faculty member, um, but there's still ways to connect with those mentors who want you to succeed. So, I really appreciate that, that advice, John. Well, I have one final question for you today, and this kind of wraps up all of these thoughts that we've been talking through and thinking about. But John, I would love to have your advice on what you would tell to our listeners about developing a mindset of lifelong learning when it comes to building one's career in life. Well, I often tell students that they need to be responsible and competent. So being responsible means that people can count on you to follow through, that you will respond to their emails and you'll do so in a timely way, that you'll be polite, you'll address people as they should be addressed. But it also goes to other issues of character, like you should learn to keep your temper in check uh, and not speak in anger. You should probably also not try to be sarcastic in emails since that usually doesn't come off very well. And I think it's also important to have a kind of self-deprecating sense of humor, just make you a more enjoyable person. So that's my advice with regard to being responsible. As for being competent, um, you obviously need to master your craft. You know, your, your work needs to be high quality and crafts can rust. So you need to practice your craft. And I think you need to acquire new skills too. And you shouldn't neglect general skills like how to write and speak in English. 
So there are some bad habits that have crept in to some of the ways we speak and write. One of them is, this might sound silly, but it's using the word me wrongly. So people will say things like, me and my friends are going to the game. Well, me is never the subject of the verb, right? And so you would never say me is going to the game. You would say I'm going to the game. So use that as kind of a rule of thumb to avoid saying that because it kind of makes you sound like you shouldn't have graduated from high school if you say something like that. So say my friends and I are going to the game or I and my friends are going to the game because I can be the subject of the verb, but not me. And if you want some more tips on proper grammar and punctuation, I recommend a book called The Blue Book of Grammar and Punctuation, which has very simple explanations for proper English grammar and punctuation. And that stuff is important. It's like if you write emails and they're full of mistakes, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. So that's a general kind of competency, just competency with the English language. So in addition to my advice about being responsible, being competent, with regard to lifelong learning, I would also encourage people to travel to other lands. Like be curious about what other people are like in other places. And when you go, learn some of the language and do your best to speak at least some phrases in the language so that you're not just expecting people to conform to you. When you travel, my advice is don't just see the sites and visit the museums, but also so attend some of the performances, whether it's music or theater or dance, and you can build a nice itinerary around going to performances. So those are some tips for lifelong learning. I love that. I especially love this idea of travel and just broadening your horizons in that regard of, of seeing how other people live their lives. And I think that can always inform us of ways that we maybe want to change or improve. And so I, I really appreciate that. Well, John, I, I have to say a huge thank you again for coming on the show today. You know, it's interesting. I always think of teachers as lifelong learners just because, I don't know, it seems relevant to the profession, but I, I really wanted to chat today um, because of one moment when I was attending SVU, I, I was having a really rough day. And I just remember you just happened to be passing by me and um, you just said, how, how was your day or something like that? And I was just having an awful day. And I remember you paused for a moment and just listened to me and I just unloaded and I was very emotional and very just, you know, frustrated with my circumstances. But I just remember that moment that you cared and you weren't just a professor at that time. You, you know, you were just a friend listening. So I think, you know, as we, as we think about this lifelong learning, I just thought of you because, you know, we're all learning. We're all trying to be better. We're all trying to figure out, you know, how we want to spend our time, what kind of careers we want to pursue. And I think a huge part of that is having people who care about us and support us in those endeavors. So I just wanted to let you know that you have helped me along my, my lifelong learning thus far. And, and I just really appreciated that. Oh, you're most welcome. I think I remember the conversation you're referring to, and I'm glad that you're doing so well, Marissa. <laughs> well, thanks so much again, John. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us here at the Career Studio today. Please join us next week as we continue to discuss this month's theme of lifelong learning. 